Chapter Fifteen of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Fifteen: The Order of the Cup. After a year at boarding school, Betty's first Sunday at home was an interesting experience, for her life had hitherto, in a measure, been centered in the church. So going to the pretty little brick edifice that morning was like a second homecoming dressed in a simple pique suit bought in new york and with a white chip hat crowning her fair head her face bright and sweet with gay and tender interest she was a picture which drew many eyes to the minister's pew and made miss jane reproach herself for a sinful wandering mind because hers dwelt so easily and gladly on the girl when her soul needed the father's admonitions to betty the day was too full for thought she loved everybody and everything every familiar face and sound thrilled her with a new meaning it is so good to be at home they seemed to say and all the summer this endearing insight lent a charm to every commonplace experience but through it ran the new and vivifying emotions that her life and study at the pines had given her the order that she and lois had talked of during those long days in the garden was in the background of her thoughts in her father's library she found an old volume on the history of the crusades and it was seldom out of her hands the beauty and romance of those olden days appealed strongly to the impressionable girl of fifteen but mingled with them also was a keen appreciation of the glory to be found in miss jane's humble life of service she used to take her little brown leather book and go into her rose retreat as she had named that part of the garden where the roses grew in wild profusion over a trellis and shaded a gray old rock and small rustic seat a high arbor vitae hedge with a narrow opening ran around this corner and gave it still more seclusion here she would sit with her elbow on the rock her face earnest with the spell of the old valiant days peter the hermit robert and godfrey became as real to her as elder huggentugler and mr dinkum the long summer days were full of the ardor of the times of the crusades and the grace and nobility of knight errantry but the order was no more than a pleasant reverie until that day late in june when the past and present mingled in her thoughts as she studied her sunday school lesson betty was tired of her sunday school class which in the summer dearth of teachers the superintendent had asked her to take deeming her general intelligence and her position as the pastor's daughter together with the aid her mother cheerfully promised to be sufficient justification for his unusual course in asking such a young girl she had labored faithfully to bring from the lesson some helpful instruction for the members of the class girls near her own age but a baffled feeling a realization that the teaching of abstract truths was not her forte was the invariable result this day she studied with a special earnestness and conscientiousness she memorized the golden text mark nine forty one for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because ye belong to christ verily i say unto you he shall not lose his reward she read the verses again and again but not a thought came to her at last she threw down her lesson leaf with something like disgust oh i can't see a thing in it for those youngsters a cup of water how in the world can they do that i give it up i'm going to tell mr marley that he'll have to get someone else thoroughly disheartened she took up her history of the crusades and tried to read but somehow there kept ringing in her ears a cup of water a cup of water now what can that mean a cup of water anybody can have a cup of water it's such a common thing to talk about oh i wonder if he could have meant that we should do the little everyday kindnesses in his name she leaned back in her seat her eyes closed her face radiant her history of the crusades clasped in her hands yes she whispered the order of the cup the order of the cup to give a cup of water in his name to do the little everyday kindnesses to our neighbors she knew now how she would teach that lesson it would be more than theory 
the ten girls in her class would help her if she only put it right miss green and miss spice were she knew interested in settlement work in new york and miss spice taught there evenings they were now raising money to send poor children to the country or seaside for a day or more why couldn't she and her class help giving a cup of water in this way her cheeks were afire with excitement as she thought of the beautiful possibility of doing something for them her home was only a few hours ride from the city perhaps some day she could have them there but she would go step by step and see if she could not raise money somehow for those children's outing eleven children for one day at the seaside the order of the cup she said to herself that's better than chivalry and crusades she would band her girls together and form an order and ask lois and edith to join it and every one who was willing to give a cup of water her ideas grew as she dwelt on the plan yes they would give a festival in her rose retreat and sell ice cream and cake and lemonade and send the money to miss green and miss spice on sunday in her enthusiastic way she told the girls her plan for putting into practice the golden text they were at once intensely interested their generous young hearts responded eagerly as she depicted the duty and glory of serving others and impressed on them that the order would mean the doing of simple little everyday things not the dreaming of doing something large and to them impossible out of a full heart she dwelt long and earnestly on the spirit in which the cup of water should be given perhaps the cup would be only the cheerful doing of some disagreeable daily task or the remembering to say thank you sincerely in closing she held up what should be the ideal of the order in the words of wordsworth that best portion of a good man's life his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love mrs baird was delighted that betty's unclaimed activity had taken such a direction seeing that the springs of the movement were pure and unselfish she encouraged and watched over this budding altruism knowing that one cannot too soon learn the lesson of service for others edith came home from a visit to her grandmother and entered heartily into the spirit of the order and the plans for raising money for the settlement by means of a festival betty ordered a dozen badges of aluminum in the shape of a cup with the words order of the cup in a scroll beneath as these were made in town their cost was small she and the children wore them much it must be confessed to the envy of the other children who however were promised admittance to the order as soon as it was fully organized and a constitution framed all over the village were posted notices of the festival which the members of the order made with rubber type every one bearing a picture of the symbolic cup and the motto they had taken for their own ut possim as i am able the enthusiasm in the order was great and lois came to weston to visit betty and help with the festival the lonely girl's pathetic joy at being in a house where the lovely home ways were preserved impressed on mrs baird the fact that not only the poor but the rich needed the offices of the new and flourishing order of the cup and her heart warmed to the pretty gentle maiden lois at once became an ardent member of the order and had a hundred badges made at her own expense to be sold to those who joined it the money going to the fund for the city children it was not made too easy to become one of the order admission was granted only after the applicant had given some evidences of her sincerity then with simple ceremonies she took a vow to do as she was able membership was limited to girls under twenty though later they had an advisory committee of older people especially the clergymen of the town any reputable person could by paying a small fee become an honorary member the sole aim of the order was personal service to do all one was able to do for others especially in small things by banding together they would be able to do this more effectually for enthusiasm would be more readily kindled and all efforts reinforced by numbers the festival was well advertised and every detail was thought out in advance by the members 
the local press was supplied by betty with copious notices not unwelcome to the country editor and the object of the festival was graphically set forth contributions of cakes ice cream lemons candy and other supplies came in abundance and tablecloths were lent by interested mothers the momentous day came from early morning betty and lois worked valiantly helped by the other members and when dusk fell they could not repress a happy crow of satisfaction over the result everything was ready the tables were attractively decorated with japanese napkins in pretty patterns with here and there large bowls of fresh-cut roses and in weston eyes the master touch dainty place cards painted with smart little ladies heads at each plate the girls had learned to paint these at the pines colored lanterns hung everywhere through the garden and with the coming of darkness the great round moon looked down on a place of real enchantment while from shadowy corners soft strains of music filled the air the members of the order waited on the tables they were all dressed in simple white with rosebuds in their hair their cup badges worn conspicuously on their left shoulders from which fell streamers of violet ribbon the color of the order mrs baird with characteristic benevolence devoted her time and energy to seeing that no one was overlooked elder huggentugler was master of ceremonies and determined that his pet's venture should be a success treated right and left while miss jane was immeasurably puffed up by her elevation to the proud eminence of the cashier's desk where each coin as it was paid in carried to her its message that lisbeth was certainly whoopin things up to-night the elder's eyes proudly followed betty's every motion and once when she had a spare moment to hang on his arm and confide to him her dreams of the order he felt as proud as though the president of the united states had entrusted him with a great state secret after all was over it was pronounced the most beautiful festival ever given in weston an evening long to be remembered in the words of the weston gazette the order cleared eighty-five dollars and this with the fifteen dollars realized from the sale of the badges made one hundred dollars which they sent at once to miss spice in a violet envelope with the compliments of the order of the cup and the hope that it would enable a large number of poor city children to enjoy the balmy breezes and other delights of the seaside for one day at least the order waxed large and prosperous until with a chapter in each church in the town its membership included nearly all the young girls in weston naturally such a movement attracted the attention of the pastors of the village and at the next meeting of the ministerial association it provoked a good deal of informal discussion i feel dr baird said mr black of the baptist church that your daughter's enthusiasm and indomitable energy combined with her firm hold on the affections of her young friends have made it a movement of power and that it has elements of permanency even though it is carried on by the young they are growing older every year and the church needs the young responded dr baird pleased with this appreciation of his daughter's ability but said mr wells of the methodist church isn't there something fantastic about it its name for instance why i consider that an inspiration rejoined mr black we cannot expect young girls to go about prosaically organizing a home missionary society as we old fogies do by all means let them have the poetic and picturesque true said the conservative mr wells as he thoughtfully adjusted his eyeglasses my daughter is heart and soul in this order and her mother says the child has been quite changed through its means i fear though and he sighed that i have grown hidebound and cannot easily adjust myself to new-fangled things his smile was singularly pleasant and quite belied his words for my part said mr black his young and sensitive face glowing i rejoice in this awakening among the young to a sense of their privileges and obligations to those who are less fortunate 
of course the fundamental idea of the organization is to help with little things bright smiles ready sympathy answered letters reading to the sick seeing the good side of people withholding from gossip and a thousand and one little courtesies in the home and in society in a word christian courtesy my oh my laughed mr golden of the presbyterian church mr black is quite an enthusiast over it because i have seen some of its results responded mr black warmly our committee on flowers for instance has been made up of young girls and in spite of everything they would at times fail us they made one petty excuse after another last week was the turn of one of the most careless members and the chairman told me that she not only went to some trouble to procure fine flowers but took an interest in arranging them and also cheerfully of course mrs wicks could not refrain from asking her what had changed her so you know mrs wicks's way she said what do you think that fly up the creek answered me i understand my duty better now mrs wicks i am a member of the order of the cup and i want to do all i am able to do order of the fiddlesticks was mrs wicks's amiable reply but the girl only laughed and replied order of the cup if you please mrs wicks by their fruits ye shall know them said another minister our church believes in interesting the young and i shall encourage this end of chapter fifteen recording by holly jensen chapter sixteen of betty baird by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter sixteen the return of the shipwrecked mariner floods delayed the return of the roommates for several days and they found the school in full swing the new girls were eager to see betty it often happens that in a school full one girl becomes the object of the romantic interest of the others and betty chanced to hold this unique position in the little world at the pines her treatment when she first came there her subsequent triumphs her success in her classes and in the play and above all her fertile leadership in picturesque adventure were told and retold many times to the new girls and cast over her a captivating glamour of romance the badges of the order worn by betty and lois were noticed at once what are you wearing those tin cups for asked the matter-of-fact caroline as she examined them with her cool scrutiny betty was aghast and glanced in disgust at the stupid girl while lois who did not take things to heart as deeply as betty laughed tin cup can't you read what is on the scroll demanded betty though she pulled away the badge so quickly that caroline could not possibly read it but it's casting pearls before she continued haughtily as she walked off in a temper tin cup indeed her cheeks flushed with offended pride a prosaic tin cup and she walked on more rapidly until she found herself almost running a great chagrin filled her all her symbols were read into mean characters by those around her they were so sordid tears of vexation came into her angry eyes as she went flying along she heard someone say with mirthful timidity atalanta she lifted her angry eyes and there standing directly in her path hat in hand was the bishop's grandson paul a bright pleased smile held the place of the half scornful half patronizing look she had often surprised on his face her wrath fell several degrees and she reached out her hand impulsively to his while a new friendliness leaped into her tones i am in a perfectly furious temper she announced her smiling face at the minute belying her words may i ask what it is all about he inquired and there was a boyish diffidence in his manner which she had never seen in the young student she hesitated the order had grown dear to her and she felt she could not bear any more after the tin cup episode what if he too should scoff at their order she touched the badge saying it is about this 
does it look like a a tin cup to you certainly not the proportions are altogether different she brightened visibly though she looked a trifle ashamed well someone called it a, a tin cup and i got mad the childish word came out with all the old force and paul laughed as i am able he translated significantly i was not able to control my temper she answered smiling but what does the cup mean he insisted as he examined the badge which she had handed to him in her rapid fashion she told the history of the order while the young student held the badge with gentle fingers his face crossed by varying expressions no untimely jest came to spoil her enthusiasm no frown aroused her antagonism miss green saw them from her window and watched them curiously wondering at their serious faces after a short silence paul said it is all so beautiful that i am bereft of words to express how i feel about it i want to be an honorary member some day i am so glad you understand said betty gratefully i do he answered and even associating it with a tin cup does not spoil the idea for me it enhances it i should not care for one of gold or silver the poor everyday vessel becomes symbolic of commonplace words or acts which are made beautiful by the spirit back of them oh how you have helped me cried betty it makes the order clearer to me too some of the members wanted silver ones but i had a feeling that something cheap and simple was more in keeping oh she exclaimed suddenly i forgot all about it but we are not allowed to talk with anybody on the campus who isn't connected with the school forgive me said paul for i spoke to you first how could you know the rules answered betty and then in a relieved voice there is miss green beckoning to me please remember me to your grandfather she added with a sudden prodding of her manners she hurried ahead of paul who is about to call on miss payne on an errand for his grandfather and ran swiftly to miss green's room and knocked softly after opening the door in response to the invitation to come in she hesitated on the threshold for her conscience about little things had become more sensitive since she had established the order come in don't pretend you are afraid said miss green genially and betty shut the door with something of a bang flew over to her and kissed her on both cheeks no cajoling warned miss green in a caressing voice as betty sat down on a footstool by her side her favorite seat and held her soft hands in her own slim brown ones how sunburned you are exclaimed miss green you are your own nut-brown maid it is not unbecoming either but confess now about your conversation out there on the campus i saw the lad stop you indeed indeed miss green i forgot all about the rules until just before i saw you before queried miss green teasingly yes before really said betty oh of course i believe you little rogue though i have known you to break the rules before without any apparent compunction yes but i let concealment like a worm in the bud feed on my damask cheek i pined in thought that may be the reason my conscience is so tender now the worm has not eaten away your quotations said miss green dryly pinching her brown cheeks frankly i thought you would come up here and justify yourself with a thousand ingenious arguments but here you are confessing at once my rugged virtue makes you gasp i see said betty teasingly but by the time she had finished miss green had her hand over the pretty soft lips seriously elizabeth why were you young folks so solemn if you had seemed happier i should have called you sooner but i was restrained by the sight of your serious faces betty was silent and a faint color came to her cheeks as she played with miss green's ring what means this new and painful reticence demanded miss green gaily it is about our order explained betty hesitatingly for she felt she could not bear to have her teacher fail to understand what had become vital to her 
oh you mean the little society you had this summer which raised all that money for our settlement that was a capital idea of yours elizabeth she said heartily yes it was that but not all we have organized permanently and taken the name the order of the cup from those verses in the bible about giving a cup of cold water in his name oh said miss green she said no more but she looked for a quiet moment out of the window and here is our badge continued betty as she handed it to the teacher ut posim read the latter and she looked at the small symbol with the bible reference mark nine forty one betty then told the whole history of the organization while miss green listened attentively without one interruption watching the eager expression the earnest eyes and the voice and seeing a change in the face not wholly due to sun brown a new meaning has come into her life and i must be careful not to disturb it she thought and she leaned over and kissed the young girl's broad brow putting back the soft hair from each side of the face and holding it between her hands and so she said gaily but sweetly this is what you have been doing while away from your old teacher at any rate i can be an honorary member betty clapped her hands with delight as she exclaimed oh will you join if i am able quoted miss green that is if i can afford the dues i'll bring you a badge at once said betty and she repeated paul's words about the tin cup through one of the chambermaids the roommates heard of an old lady living in the village near the school who was friendless and nearly blind on further inquiries they learned that mrs humphrey for such was her name had sufficient means to live in some degree of comfort but suffered greatly because her blindness deprived her of her lifelong pleasure reading betty at once proposed that they go and read to her they consulted miss green about it and she readily consented to go with them to see if things were as represented and if so she would secure permission from their parents for them to read to her once a week therefore the following saturday afternoon the three went to mrs humphrey's little house which they found standing in the midst of a weedy plot of grass surrounded by a tumble-down fence everything on the outside bearing evidence of long neglect but there was a promise of better things inside in the sunny swiss curtains at the windows and the cheerful pots of well-kept geraniums on the window-sills in answer to their knock a tall commanding-looking woman about sixty years of age came to the door she was still handsome despite the evidences of suffering on her worn countenance her hair was snowy white plainly arranged her dark eyes soft and gentle and lovely the house was rather bare but absolutely neat and homelike a table and several chairs of fine design speaking of better days some pieces of old china at once captivated miss green's antiquarian fancy and led to an easy and natural conversation it was not difficult for the teacher then in her frank kind way to tell the reason for their call but mrs humphrey while evidently pleased showed her appreciation with some reserve she and miss green found much in common however so that before the call came to an end she gladly consented to having the two girls read to her the next saturday before that day miss green saw the old lady's pastor and learned all he knew about her history mrs humphrey and her husband had come into his parish two years before with a letter from a church in the far south they mingled little with others and were apparently suffering from a deep sorrow the cause of which was unknown though the pastor said he had reason to believe it was due to the death of a son after the husband's death about a year since mrs humphrey had failed physically and her eyesight had gone almost entirely she politely but firmly refused to discuss her affairs and her reserve had alienated the few people she had met the next saturday betty and lois taking a new book of cheerful tone went to mrs humphrey's cottage she was charmed with the fresh young voices and laughed heartily at the bright passages in the story 
while they waited a little for betty's voice to rest mrs humphrey told them several amusing stories and in return betty described an old churchyard at home where there were many curious epitaphs one especially delighted her the large lot had four flat stones in memory of a man and his three wives on the first stone was inscribed sacred to conjugal affection and to the memory of joanna wife of hezekiah hornswoggler the second contained insatiate anchor would not one suffice on the third was thy shaft flew thrice and thrice my peace was slain mrs humphrey smilingly contributed another anecdote and so laughing together they became good friends i thank you much for coming said mrs humphrey as they were leaving this is the pleasantest afternoon i have had for a long time i shall expect you next saturday afternoon oh we have enjoyed it so much responded the girls and you may be sure we'll be here bright and early next week true to their promise they were there bright and early the next saturday and the following ones bringing much cheer to the lonely bereaved woman and in return hearing the most fascinating tales of southern life before and during the great civil war not a small item of the attractiveness of the little cottage to the girls was the snowy southern biscuit and mrs humphrey's own orange marmalade which she regularly provided for them it perhaps never occurred to the girls that probably they wouldn't have stuck so nobly to their altruistic undertaking had it not been for these toothsome dainties and the exciting wartime tales several weeks after their first visit they were having their usual good time reading and eating and telling stories when mrs humphrey took a letter from a little shelf over the window and handed it to betty i am sorry to trouble you dear but may i ask you to read this letter for me i have had it for some time but my eyes have been so bad lately that i can't make it out i am not very good at deciphering strange handwriting but i'll do my best said betty as she took the blurred and almost illegible letter postmarked bombay india dear madam she began reading very slowly i take pleasure in 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 what's that word in informing you that i can't make out that name it's someone's name mrs humphrey have you any relative or friend in bombay oh no my child i am alone utterly alone but i wonder what it could be from bombay say she asked in some excitement yes from bombay mrs humphrey and this is someone's name i can't make it out i don't know whose it could be my only son was lost at sea and my husband died a year ago and they were all i had in the world what was your son's name asked betty sympathetically mortimer dear oh what a pretty name exclaimed betty then resumed her attempt to decipher the letter one look and she gave a start and turned pale will you excuse me mrs humphrey if i take this outside so i can see it better asked betty much agitated as she motioned lois to follow her mrs humphrey was rocking in her chair forgetful of them for the moment as she mourned over her lost ones once outside betty grasped lois's arm until she winced as she said oh lois it's mortimer i'm sure it's mortimer and it says he's coming home this month what shall we do oh i wish miss green was here i'm afraid to tell mrs humphrey here comes miss green now said lois in an intense whisper and they both sped down the path to meet her excitedly betty told her the story and thrust the letter into her hand saying it does say mortimer is coming doesn't it miss green oh do say he is coming mrs humphrey thinks he was lost in a shipwreck if it is mortimer it must be mrs humphrey's son and certainly that word is mortimer answered miss green oh then mrs humphrey's son who is shipwrecked and died at sea is coming home this month she exclaimed as she whisked lois up the path 
miss green though puzzled saw from betty's excited manner and incoherent words that something of importance had happened sit down here on the step betty and try to calm yourself while i read this over again so there will be no doubt as to its meaning miss green read and reread the letter carefully before she said it certainly says that her son mortimer is coming home this month this will be glorious news to her but i must break it to her gently as they entered the room miss green greeted her cheerfully recalling her from her sad memories and bringing her mind back to the letter which for the time she had forgotten how do you do miss green she said i am glad to see you i was just telling these dear children about my boy mortimer did i understand that he was lost at sea mrs humphrey asked miss green he was wrecked in the indian ocean two years ago and the boat that he and several others got away in was never heard of again though two others reached land safely are you sure that his boat was never heard of again urged miss green oh miss green i have had no news of any kind i read the papers every day until three months ago when my eyes failed and nothing has ever been heard of them not a thing but you know mrs humphrey that sailors are often saved after the most undreamed of experiences and long after their relatives have given them up for dead i know i know said mrs humphrey despondently but if mortimer had been saved i should have known it before this time he surely would have sent me word somehow but mrs humphrey i know of a case very much like yours where a sailor was wrecked and all on board were reported lost after drifting around for several weeks they were picked up by a whaling vessel that did not return from its cruise for over a year then this boy of whom i am speaking was taken sick in a foreign land and could not send any word to his mother for long months after she believed him dead she stopped for mrs humphrey looked at her with a startled expression the letter said something about someone coming to see her her breath came in gasps and she could only say go on go on after this boy had been sick a long time continued miss green a friend of his wrote to his mother that he was coming home and that he would see her soon on on the and miss green hesitated not knowing how much she dared say for mrs humphrey was gazing at her in anguished expectation in october she asked in a faint whisper miss green nodded affirmatively as she pointed to the letter oh it can't be my boy my boy cried mrs humphrey and she dropped on her knees and buried her face in miss green's lap sobbing out her heart betty and lois who had been held fascinated by the romance of the scene now stole out of the house and hand in hand hurried to their room and closed the door without uttering a word the next week when the girls went to mrs humphrey's cottage they found her radiantly happy with her was a tall noble-looking sunburned young man whom she introduced as her son mortimer the girls fearful of intruding would have hurried away but the son when he learned that they were the two who had been instrumental in informing his mother of his homecoming insisted that they should remain to hear the story of his shipwreck and rescue which they were delighted to do three years before he had sailed as first mate in a ship bound for india and china with an assorted cargo of yankee notions when they had disposed of them they started on the return trip with a full load of oriental goods and were progressing finely when they were caught in one of those terrific typhoons characteristic of the indian ocean passing as suddenly as it came it left them a complete wreck with all the masts over the side and the seams in the hull opened so wide that the ship was sinking rapidly hastily provisioning their small boats they embarked in them and sailed for the nearest port colombo in ceylon which they hoped to make in about a week sailing the third day after the wreck the boats were separated by a squall and soon after that the one commanded by mr humphrey was picked up by a whaling ship bound for the antarctic whaling grounds 
the captain of the whaler kind-hearted man though he was could not afford to return to port to land the shipwrecked seamen and the only thing for them to do was to go along with him the whaling voyage lasted over a year and on the return trip mr humphrey was taken sick and was landed in bombay where he was sent to the hospital there he lay for nearly three months too weak to talk but as soon as he gained sufficient strength he asked the hospital surgeon an american to write to his mother the letter which the girls had read as soon as he was sufficiently recovered he secured a mate's berth in a homeward bound vessel and the long voyage completely restored him to his normal condition of robust health at the conclusion of his narrative in which he included many interesting details mr humphrey brought out his carved sea chest and showed the girl some of the quaint and curious things he had gathered together in his life at sea during which he had visited practically all the important ports in every country on the globe the chest was packed to overflowing with things sent to his mother from time to time which she had carefully preserved for him though he greatly mourned certain prize treasures lost when the ship went down the girl's eyes glowed at the sight and mr humphrey laughed as he said to his mother just look at their eyes mother you could hang hats on them which caused the girls to join heartily in the laughter they were fairly breathless as they handled the marvelous products of oriental patience and disregard of time they were especially interested in the ancient bronze and carved ivory idols the japanese sword guards of measureless antiquity the silver bracelets and anklets of delicate and intricate workmanship the priceless india shawls and scarfs the beautiful ivory inlaid teak wood boxes the slippers of grotesque shapes with wonderful decorative designs the ivory fans covered with tiny carved figures the choice collection of small arms of all countries and numberless other things of which the girls had never even heard after they had seen and handled them to their heart's content the two young girls were astonished beyond measure when mr humphrey thanking them for the joy they had brought to his mother insisted that each should take as a memento of the occasion one of the wonderful teakwood boxes inlaid with carved ivory and bound with dainty hammered metal strips among his most prized possessions he sent to miss green a wonderful centuries-old idol of carved ivory which his mother knew would appeal to her antiquarian tastes clasping their treasures to their breasts and treading on air the roommates walked to the school in a thrilling atmosphere of romance and it was many weeks before they lost the feeling that they were characters in an old romantic tale End of chapter sixteen Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 17 of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 17 The Masquerade There was great excitement at the Pines when it was announced that they were again to have a masquerade it had been omitted the year before much to the disappointment of the pupils for it was always the most popular entertainment given the date set for it this year was washington's birthday it was strictly private only the pupils attending betty was charmed with the idea and she and her roommate had many long conversations over the selection of their costumes as far as possible the girls kept their disguises from each other so that there was always great excitement when the time came for unmasking our roommates however did not attempt secrecy towards each other why half the fun is in talking it over to each other and changing our minds every half hour said betty i am going to be some character that demands a black wig she went on for i've always wanted black jet black hair and now is my chance well said lois what character will you take oh if i can't do any better i shall make my character suit my wig for one night i am going to be just the kind of looking girl i have always wanted to be i am going to be tall so i shall have high heels and wear my wig piled up on top of my head my wig will be without one crimp 
i love red cheeks so i'll paint mine red like jess's i shall wear red all the red i can i have been tied to blue until i'm sick of it are you going to be a japanese lady or queen isabella asked lois slyly oh i have changed my mind again i am going to be volumnia the noble roman mother of coriolanus i'll have a red toga did the women wear togas and bands through my glorious black hair i'll learn her speeches and quote them to every one i meet how many will know them asked lois whose common sense never deserted her i shall answered betty grandly i am going to enjoy myself of course she continued as if it were an afterthought i shall look at the other make-ups but for this one evening i am not going to be elizabeth i am to be volumnia of rome i am going to make believe just as i did when i was six years old i'll be the roman matron but and she looked pensive i wish i could be proud of my son i have to prod him so i should think you would enjoy that part of it betty laughed lois of all the griefs that harass the distressed sure the most bitter is a scornful jest quoted betty in mock sorrow do you know that two of the girls are going to wear their brother's military suits said lois how do you know i thought everything about the masquerade was to be such a secret a secret at the pines impossible lois exclaimed oh i have it now lois let us be viola and sebastian we can soon have suits made up like those we saw in twelfth night in new york i must be viola just so i can say she never told her love etc i reckon you've forgotten that i suggested that right in the beginning i do hope you'll stick to it long enough to get the suits made the evening for the masquerade came and with it more martha washington's mary queen of scots and charlotte corday's than this humdrum world could conveniently hold the girls viola and sebastian costumes consisted of knee breeches of brown cloth brown stockings buckled slippers and brown capes reaching almost to the ground while a jaunty brown cap with a feather in it completed each fetching get-up as they wore wigs and were not unlike in size and weight they really seemed like twins jessie bentworth naturally selected a mirth-provoking costume with three other fun-loving spirits she formed a quartet making a pun by the way and they named themselves the sally forths their make-up was extremely absurd and caused great amusement they wore comic masks both on their faces and on the backs of their heads scoop bonnets open at both ends rope hair falling down both sides of their shoulders and gloves with two thumbs as their long and remarkable skirts concealed their feet it was simply impossible to tell which way they were really facing they were constantly followed by a troop of masqueraders who in vain tried to discover the true faces poor janice is a back number after this said one puzzled follower a very modern-looking cadet helen paired off with queen elizabeth dorothy who is in all the glory of a monstrous ruff for which she showed great solicitude she was constantly in shrewish tones warning her companion to take care of my ruff a quaker edna norris and a clown pauline hayes apparently found some peculiar ground in common for they were inseparable the motley and the gray mingling in the dances while mephistopheles and little Bo peep sat cosily side by side on the stairs bell hunter being mephistopheles and caroline Bo peep the characters that caused most remark were beauty and the beast as jess said it would take a colossal nerve for any one to take the part of beauty but when unmasking time came she said she was not surprised to see miriam's face appear from behind the mask the beast's costume was ingenious including a donkey's head of which the ears eyes and jaw moved and carried out the character of the animal in a startling manner to betty the crowning feature of the evening came when miss green as martha washington and miss payne as queen elizabeth accosted her without knowing who she was she had purposely remained seated in a melancholy attitude waiting for an opportunity to deliver her beloved speech 
prithee young page why of so melancholy countenance asked the stately queen tapping him on the shoulder with her fan while the sedate martha washington stood by in republican simplicity with a despairing gesture and head bowed mournfully the page repeated she never told her love but let concealment like a worm in the bud feed on her damask cheek she pined in thought and with a green and yellow melancholy she sat like patience on a monument smiling at grief was not this love indeed we men may say more swear more but indeed our shows are more than will for still we prove much in our vows but little in our love so sadly impressive was the attitude and so thrilling the tone that every eye in the room turned to the slight young figure while the noble sweet voice rang out at the last words the two pages vanished through a nearby door followed by loud clappings and cries of bravo but the pages remained invisible until the excitement had passed when they came quietly in the military suits of which lois had spoken were very successful and lent dignity to the evening after the shakespeare recital one of the wearers dogged betty and lois until they turned in great scorn hast no sword good fellow jibed viola shaking her toy sword the two pages laughed scornfully and walked away but the young soldier followed avaunt or i'll run you through threatened sebastian but the soldier pursued them courageously nature hath framed strange fellows in her time said viola to sebastian in a stage whisper and she continued tauntingly why are we so pestered with a popinjay oh monstrous replied sebastian looking back fiercely at their silent shadow when the pages sat the silent soldier sat when they walked he walked but never a word uttered he who in the world is it betty asked in an undertone i didn't think there was a girl in the school who could hold her tongue this long i'm almost afraid said lois nonsense said betty i'm proud of her and i shall watch when the masks are taken off there are four soldiers so we must keep our eyes on them by the way lois i thought you told me only two of the girls were going to wear cadet suits i wonder who else decided to wear them then insolently over her shoulder to the silent figure art thou there true penny how do you remember all those quotations sighed lois enviously i can't think of one why i have been quoting all my life and many's the time i have been scolded for it but this proves that no learning is lost she answered in a mock-wise tone oh i have thought of one rejoiced lois then turning sternly on the cadet said assume a virtue if you have it not and come here and try to talk the soldier came and sat just in front of them but he said not a word as he moved towards them viola said by the pricking of my thumbs something evil this way comes and she pointed her sword at the grim soldier excellent dumb discourse she added as they walked off stumbling over their swords in their haste for my voice i have lost it she continued disdainfully i was never so bethumped with words hissed at last the silent one and he disappeared in the crowd at the sound of his voice betty started it was familiar yet she could not at the instant recollect whose it was but it gave her an impression of not belonging to one of the schoolgirls did you recognize her voice she asked lois i have been wondering the latter answered it sounds familiar yet i can't think which of the girls it is well said betty we'll watch those cadets when they unmask it was a good imitation of a boy's voice but we certainly can pick her out from the four when the hour for unmasking arrived betty leaned over excitedly to lois and whispered lois there are only two cadets here and i know neither of them was the one who spoke to us who could the other two have been and why aren't they here now the two girls looked into each other's puzzled eyes as lois repeated who could they have been end of chapter seventeen recording by holly jensen
Chapter Eighteen of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Eighteen: The Class Election. Throughout her second year, Betty devoted herself assiduously to her studies she was beginning to see school life with maturer eyes to realize something of its value as a preparation for the future while the order of the cup had revealed to her some of the deeper lessons of her relations to her fellow beings she made special efforts to be of service to the new girls to make them feel at home and to help them in their studies especially in latin where her father's thorough training stood her in good stead almost all of the girls in the school joined the order of which betty had been elected president it had the warm approval of miss payne and miss green who felt that such a society was the best kind the girls could have young people as well as old it seemed needed an organization to which to be loyal betty kept up an active correspondence with the weston chapter of the order the members of which had much girlish pleasure in the fact that so many pupils at the pines were affiliated with them in the work her constant endeavor to live up to the ideal of the order made betty thoughtful and gentle she was growing intellectually and spiritually far more than she knew that she had grown physically was brought forcibly to her attention on the evening late in the spring when her class elected officers for the senior year she dressed alone and hurriedly put on the lilac silk of which the sleeves just a year ago had been changed from weston into paris terms of style she had not worn it for six months or more as there was no pier glass in the room she did not notice the length of the skirt indeed she rarely thought of her clothes except in the matter of neatness though in the first year in school she had had occasion to think a good deal whether or not they were near enough to current styles to escape ridicule her hair now almost golden as it outgrew its childish fairness was less unruly and though it fell in soft thick masses over her head with only fluffy tendrils straying over her forehead it was neatly turned up with a black bow as its ornament this evening as betty quickly traversed the brightly lighted corridors she met miriam who gave her one long look then ran away laughing mockingly what is she laughing about betty asked herself she stood under the electric light pondering before entering the recitation room where the election was to be held when miriam returned with two of her followers and silently and insolently stared up and down at betty's dress then they broke forth into peals of harsh laughter what is the matter with you girls demanded betty but no one replied and the laughter brought other girls to the scene jessie and dorothy among them what is that goose laughing about anyway she asked jess and dorothy for her temper was aroused by miriam's manner i can't see anything to laugh about answered jess what is it all about she demanded curtly of miriam with whom she had lost all patience but miriam and her friends only continued their sneering laughter can't you see that her dress is too funny at last said miriam derisively it is four inches too short commented another perfectly killing added miriam she looks like little violet dare and she shows her black stockings they're cotton too i do believe said the third girl jess looked down at the dress you're a perfect dunce miriam she said betty too looked down at it for pity's sake she exclaimed delightedly why i am growing like a bad weed i haven't had this on for six months so you see what a giant i'll soon be you're a regular beanstalk said dorothy as betty turned to miriam to say thank you with all my heart for calling my attention to my dress it would have been more like you to allow me to go into the room just as i am this is not the first time you have tried to make me a laughing stock and failed you did not think far enough this evening well she's sorry enough now that she didn't wait she didn't think of it until you spoke i saw that in her face said dorothy betty looked down at her short skirt ruefully 
it will take more ruffles and bands than miss jane has at her command to elongate this dress sufficiently the election this year was marked by unusual electioneering and wire-pulling by miriam in her efforts to defeat betty who was regarded by nearly all of the members of the class as the only logical candidate for the presidency miriam with a zeal worthy of a better cause was determined to defeat her and for this purpose nominated helen dyke who consented only after miriam used her most persuasive powers to convince her that it was not a good thing to have only one candidate the coming election was much discussed in the corridors and feeling ran high why betty is the only one to be considered said lois for what other girl has her power of organization of ready invention and of gracious presiding her voice alone would outweigh all other considerations said caroline who had grown to admire betty to such an extent that she copied her language as far as her gifts would allow yes and there are her graceful odd little ways like no one else's in the world mary livingstone used to say they were distinguished said jess don't you think she is stuck up since she visited the livingstones and the kings at easter they made such a fuss over her asked one of the newer girls who had come under miriam's influence lois and jess laughed it wouldn't be hard to tell where you heard that said jess miriam is saying that to all the new girls yes it was miriam answered the new girl Ugh, i knew it said jess in a disgusted tone looking at the others why betty never thinks whether people are rich or not said lois spiritedly when she returned she talked about it just as she does about everything else it was a new experience for her and she felt their kind hospitality mary wrote to me that everyone went wild over her and one old lady insisted on taking her to europe wasn't it fortunate girls that miriam laughed at betty's short dress in the corridor said jess it made me mad at first but now i'm glad of it you know girls are mighty funny about such things and if she had appeared before the class that way and someone had started a laugh it might have lost her the election here she comes now exclaimed caroline doesn't she look too sweet for anything in white i can't see how anyone would think of voting for any other girl the three girls then formed an escort of honor to conduct betty into the classroom where she was received with such a storm of applause that miriam's face fell with disappointment the election that followed resulted as jess expressed it in a walkover for betty who went to her room proud and happy as the recipient of the highest honor in the bestowal of her classmates lois jess caroline dorothy and bell followed her to her room to congratulate her what a pity it is that mary livingstone isn't here she would be so proud of you said jess oh don't i wish she were here exclaimed betty fervently i have missed her terribly this year but then i have had such good friends she added looking about affectionately and putting her arms around the necks of lois and jess who were sitting beside her on the window seat do you know what i've been thinking about she continued i was thinking how hard it was for me at first when the girls made fun of my funny old dresses and how easy it was this evening when miriam laughed at me just because i have the best friends in the world and jumping up she gave each of them a regular bear's hug and a vigorous kiss end of chapter eighteen recording by holly jensen Chapter Nineteen of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter Nineteen. Betty and Lois talk over the summer. Two delighted girls threw themselves into each other's arms on the opening day of their third year at the Pines. Lois had spent the summer in Europe with her father betty had stayed in weston with the exception of a number of short visits to relatives with her parents each was full of questions and stirring tales of the summer's experiences 
as soon as dinner was finished they rushed up to their room and after some preliminary hugs and kisses and smoothings of hair and exclamations of delight at being together again they began fast as the human tongue could go they recited in turn every detail of the summer lois told of her travels in england scotland holland france and switzerland of interesting places and quaint customs fascinating as they had been however her warm heart turned readily enough from them to the people in weston whom she had learned to love dearly because they first had given her insight into the depths of genuine human affections of which by reason of her early orphanhood and her father's travelling life she had known almost nothing before her visit to weston two years before she insisted that betty must tell her everything connected with her father and mother which the latter gladly did then asked her now lois whom do you want to hear about next oh dear miss jane and elder hug and tugler of course the two dearest old people in the world exclaimed lois yes but i can't tell you about them both at once can i which one first insisted betty well miss jane first said lois how often i think of her does she still calculate how eggs is oh dear yes and she still knits wash rags i have one she sent you i forgot to get it out of my trunk the red border shows her love for you only her pets get a red border for she thinks it a sinful waste of time to ornament anything but wastes i was at her house for tea just before i left home and it was one of the best meals i ever ate such neatness and refinement too but just imagine how i felt lois when we were seated and her mother said to me make yourself to hum lisbeth we're to hum and we wish you was too but but betty i don't understand her mother is one of the dearest old ladies in the world surely she didn't mean that she wanted you to go home wanted me to go home and betty laughed and laughed until the tears ran down her cheeks why of course not you little goose what she meant was that she wanted me to feel as homey as if it were really my own home oh exclaimed lois and she too laughed hilariously but that wasn't the funniest betty continued miss jane's nephew was there and when i took a second leg of the best fried chicken i ever tasted the little fellow eyed me in such a heartbroken way and squalled out oh auntie jane there she's gone and et my leg oh i can see it all just how miss jane glared at him laughed lois didn't she though so many funny things happened this summer oh tell me every one of them i love to hear about those dear funny people why just think one sunday morning dear old elder huggentugler evidently absorbed in something walked into the church clear down to his pew which you know is in the very front with his hat on and his old green umbrella open and held high over his head even father had to hide a smile behind his hand what's that speech mr dinkum said every wednesday night at prayer meeting i was trying to think of it this summer to tell father when he was blue but i couldn't remember exactly what it was oh lois don't you remember how he always wound up his trembling voice rising continually to the end so i'll roll round with the year and never stand still till the master appears and says it is enough come up higher has he washed yet asked lois laughing there's no evidence of it said betty you know how clean elder huggentugler always is he says it riles his stomach to see that dirty man one wednesday evening in prayer meeting i was sitting next to him we were singing on jordan's stormy banks i stand and right in front of us was mr dinkum singing at the top of his voice the elder leaned over to me and with such a funny twinkle in his eye whispered i hope that dirty man falls in and washes some of the coal off of him before he gets across and he grinned most maliciously you know how the elder used to talk about that screech owl as he always called the organ he's gotten all over that he loves music so much that he couldn't keep out 
we organized a choir and always sang an opening anthem and he just couldn't keep away he says now he really believes he isn't as much of a stick in the mud as he thought he was perhaps your singing in the choir had something to do with the change suggested lois do you think so asked the surprised girl i never thought of that i guess it was his love for music not for me do you remember mary smith she continued who came to the house one evening with her beau john hill for tickets for the festival and stayed so long and said such funny things well they were married this summer oh were they exclaimed lois yes they came to our house for the ceremony mary insisted on having a rehearsal though there was no one but our family to witness the ceremony so we all went into the sitting-room where father rehearsed them as we started to the parlor mary admonished john to keep his hat on during the ceremony when i objected she said she thought as she wore her hat he ought to wear his adding he looks so nice in his new stovepipe and john wore it the girls laughed until jess came in to see what they were laughing about End of chapter 19. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 20 of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 20. Her Commencement. Betty's last year at the Pines was a time of great development always graceful and untrammeled her slender figure had acquired a dignity of carriage which combined with the rapidly increasing maturity of her face gave a vivid impression of forceful personality she lost none of her vivacity or brightness of spirit always cheerful and hopeful she brimmed over with sunshine she possessed too that indefinable something which the girls called style and those who looked deeper spoke of as charm a distinction which came principally from her self-forgetfulness by some rare good fortune betty had skipped that painful period of self-consciousness when the real girl seems for a time to become imprisoned and some suffering blushing unhappy and malapert witch to have usurped her place poor misunderstood things when they want to make a brilliant speech nine times out of ten they are accused of impertinence or sarcasm their speeches before and after being made it seems to them are like the trick of the clever magician in which he puts a rose up his sleeve and in its place takes out a viper this lack of awkwardness in betty miss green believed to be due to the influence of the order of the cup which early had taught her to consider other people's feelings and interests until her own had only a normal and healthy proportion of her thoughts and dreams but betty remained a dreamer to the end a dreamer in the sense of one to whom came beautiful visions of life as it might be and as she was young enough to believe it would be thoughts that lifted her feet from the earth to walk on clouds they kept her young in the ways of the world and indifferent to worldly valuations though her growing sense of fitness and beauty made her sensitive to the many small amenities and ceremonies of life of which she had been blissfully ignorant when she first came to the pines she profited greatly too by her association with the strong characters of miss green and miss spice whose influence supplemented that of the equally strong though essentially different character of her mother miss green was in the best sense a woman of the world cultured by contact with leaders of thought and action both here and abroad not only a teacher but a writer on the great educational topics of the day and a participant in many of the advanced philanthropic movements of the metropolis in all respects a woman of action yet one who had kept her heart warm and her spirit youthful and whose never failing appreciation of the sources of girlhood impulses made her a much sought confidant and adviser of the young betty's mother cultivated in all the good old home culture of which new england is justly proud for she had moved to pennsylvania from new england was of all women the most unworldly education she had of the highest degree 
she was widely read in the masterpieces of ancient and modern literature and thoroughly conversant with the topics of the times as presented in the leading newspapers and magazines yet she conceived her duty to lie chiefly if not entirely with her home and her husband's flock to them she was ministering angel counsellor guide and friend between these two similar in breeding and feeling though so far apart in their experiences of life both representing in its highest type the grand old name of gentlewoman betty received rare training in all the essentials of perfect womanhood miss spice more than any other teacher at the pines developed her love of learning for its own sake she was pre-eminently the scholar of the school to study and to teach the things she loved to study made up to miss spice almost the sum and substance of life a somewhat extended sojourn in foreign countries had meant little but additional opportunities for adding to her store of knowledge and of these she had availed herself to the full her learning however had not destroyed her sympathy with the submerged of our great cities and her one hobby a hobby which had survived the trials of ten years was the settlement work in new york to which the festival of the order of the cup had generously contributed her interest in betty starting with her desire to see her progress in her own beloved branch of mathematics had been greatly increased and intensified by betty's enthusiasm for the order whose efforts so far as it concerned the members work outside of their own immediate environment she had turned principally in the direction of supporting enlarged fresh air work by the settlement betty's cousin miss payne had exercised very little influence on her life almost continual travelling had kept her away from the school she had been in england and the girls said in every city and town in the united states that boasted a woman's club during her long and frequent absences miss green had charge of the school and its success was abundant testimony to her ability to conduct it in lois betty found an ideal companion and friend during those first weeks of her severe trial their friendship struck its roots deep into the soil of sympathy and similarity of taste and feeling it was a friendship unique among schoolgirls for its stability and its unselfishness though unlike in many characteristics the two girls never jarred and in all their dreams of the future which were many in this dream time of early girlhood they were always together doing the same things loving the same people cherishing the same ideals mary livingstone next to lois was the schoolmate betty admired most and that she was several years older only added to her charm but mary had graduated the first year and since then they had only met on betty's short visit to new york and at the commencement season she had been betty's first champion when the latter was the poor persecuted little soul and as such she would wear a halo throughout betty's life yes her future would be without some of its essential ingredients if she could not see mary often during the year betty and miriam were thrown more and more into each other's society until the bitterness of miriam's feeling greatly diminished owing to the outgrowing of childish jealousy and to the determination of some of their friends that they should come together in a united class sentiment of course betty was pleased to be on less unpleasant terms with the only unfriendly girl in the school and she went fully halfway to make up while their relationship never developed into friendship at least it ceased to be open hostility betty and lois resumed their reading to mrs humphrey and continued it through the year for her son had been appointed master of a ship and had gone off on another long voyage though not before seeing his mother provided with a constant companion the son's long letters about distant lands and adventures afforded them intense delight and the elderly woman and the two young girls passed many gay hours imagining the things the sailor graphically described commencement week came and the life at the pines which at first had seemed interminable was now almost at an end 
betty said it reminded her of an accordion all stretched out at the beginning three years before and now closed the folded years hidden away and the two ends meeting she had gone through her final examinations with flying colors and had gained the proud post of valedictorian dorothy was salutatorian miriam was class poet jess as class historian found ample field for her jokes and bright reminiscences lois held the grave position of class prophet and she and betty had some happy hours as they dreamed of the future of this wonderful class for betty one of the greatest events of the week was the coming of mr bird and she was all excitement over seeing her best friend's father he was small and delicate looking and one saw at a glance that the daughter had inherited many of her fine and charming traits from this very reserved but lovable man his health required him to spend a large part of his time in travel and he was rejoiced that in the future he would have his daughter for a travelling companion of course betty's father and mother came and every one at once fell in love with the sweet-faced woman there was some shyness with the father to whose profound scholarship miss payne had more than once referred his apparent coldness the result of a natural reserve and a studious life gave to strangers the impression of hauteur which his somewhat pedantic phraseology tended to augment but his parishioners who knew the sterling qualities that underlay the reserved exterior never made this mistake on this occasion he fell easily and naturally into his place in the company of the bishop and the other learned men who had honored the occasion with their presence with them he was perfectly at ease and discussed the most abstruse questions with the utmost freedom and an authority of erudition that gave him a high position among them the most startling event of that momentous week was who would believe it that miss jane and the elder came with dr and mrs baird to see betty graduate the roommates could hardly believe the astounding news but the first thing they saw as the train stopped was miss jane's eager face and waving behind it the elder's old green umbrella the elder became a great favorite with the class and he did himself proud by presenting to betty's particular friends some real nice posies as he called the superb roses he had brought for the great occasion roses of his own growing but he saved an immense bunch to give to betty when she read her valedictory miss jane had the time of her life and not only inspected the styles at a distance but felt of the lovely gowns until she had a full realization of the flimsy character of modern materials and of the shame of wasting time and money on them the inside seams of gowns fresh from some famous metropolitan dressmaker were a scandal to her while at the school miss jane's manner in private was very severe over the extravagance and the poor inside finish of the dresses but when she got back to weston it underwent a complete change and her air of authority on such matters as she told of the splendors of the pines was a wonder to behold commencement day arrived and to the eager eyes scanning the sky at daybreak it presented an unbroken expanse of heavenly blue night came on fair and cool for that time of the year though so accommodating is nature at rare times for which we love her as we do in frequent smiles it was not too cool for those ideal dress materials of a young girl's commencement white mull organdy and swiss betty's simple lovely dress the gift of her cousin gave her a feeling of rapture that only one other dress can equal in a girl's lifetime lois wore one not unlike it indeed all the girls looked like white rosebuds from the quaint old garden which they were soon to leave forever the music the flowers the soft summer air the glamour of to-morrow the dear fearful future all gave a joy akin to sorrow indeed the nearest to sorrow that many of them had ever felt but hopes were high and life was a fair sea on which their tiny barks would soon be launched life just the word thrilled them 
how it ran like a golden thread through all they said these fair brave young mariners the elder at eighty was awed into something like respect for this life he had so unthinkingly sailed having his work to do he had never meditated on it but as it fell from the sweet young lips the word took on a new meaning and he tried to catch its elusive sense miss jane just enjoyed the purdiness of it all keeping one unwavering eye on betty and the other on the outlook for anything new in styles when betty arose to deliver the valedictory mrs baird clasped her hands and turned pale the doctor sat immovable but intense miss jane peered around to see how everyone was taking that ravishing vision then her eyes never left the girl's face the elder crouched down in his seat and waited for the music of her voice the bishop's face brightened and he leaned over to whisper to paul whose glance at betty and affirmative nod to his grandfather seemed to have something in common while the body of students seated in the front rows greeted their leader their heroine with a subdued worshipful ah as she stood there her face slightly flushed with excitement she was a very different girl from the one who had come to the school nearly three years before though perhaps not tall for her age she was above the medium height her tow-colored hair had darkened and the yellow tints had deepened until it could without any stretch of the imagination be called golden the unruly tangle had become a soft fluffy wave which made a charming frame for the sweet young face in her dark brown eyes were golden lights which caught between the thick lashes gave a feeling of brightness of sunlight her voice had long been noted for its richness and sweetness and that combined with an inspiring personality lent to her words perhaps undue importance but that they were of unusual weight for one so young was acknowledged by the bishop who felt like the elder that he had discovered the young girl and had a part in her triumphs as she stood there ready to read her short farewell a little dog his tail drooping in utter dejection walked pathetically up the aisle and across the platform and sat down sorrowfully at betty's side on her first train looking up into her face with sad adoring eyes he had been rolling in the mud and the tear-stained locks marked dark circles around his bloodshot and melancholy eyes patiently he sat there and betty evidently careful not to disturb him looked down with a smile and went on speaking without a break with his dismal old face turned up adoringly he watched her until she had finished joined in the storm of applause that followed by thumping his stumpy tail wildly on the floor then walked slowly off the platform and disappeared as he had come after miss payne had uttered the closing words of the exercises betty sat there receiving congratulations surrounded by bouquets of magnificent flowers from the livingstones and half a dozen other city friends from the bishop and his grandsons from the elder from miss jane from lois's father and from many undergraduates but the elder said she's the purtiest posy of em all End of chapter 20. Recording by Holly Jensen. End of Betty Baird by Anna Hamlin Weichel.